Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first talk in our summer research uh, seminar series, Out to Sea. My name is Rebecca Tropp, and I am the research and events convener here at the Paul Mellon Center. I'm very happy to introduce this evening's speaker, Anne Elias, who will be giving an approximately 30 to 40 minute talk, followed by a response from Morgan Daniels. After a conversation between Anne and Morgan, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Those of you in the room will be able to ask your question directly to Anne and Morgan, and we will have someone walking around the room with a microphone, and please speak into the mic uh, for our online audience to be able to hear you. And for those of you joining us online, please type your questions into the Q&A box, and I will read them out. As a brief introduction to today's speakers, Anne Elias is Professor Emerita in History of Art at the University of Sydney. Her research areas include imagery relating to camouflage in art, war, and nature, flowers and natural history in art, and the aesthetics of the underwater regions of oceans. Her latest book, Coral Empire, Underwater Oceans, Colonial Tropics, Visual Modernity, which was published by Duke University Press in 2019, discusses the adventures and explorations of early photographers in tropical waters in the Bahamas and the Australian Great Barrier Reef. Her more recent work investigates early theories of underwater optics and subaquatic animals, including a forthcoming article in Leonardo on fish, fishers, and underwater vision. Her talk this evening is connected to her new book in progress on Sydney Harbour, which continues an inquiry into human entanglements with oceans. Morgan Daniels is senior lecturer in history and media at Arcadia University, the College of Global Studies, London Centre. He received his PhD from Queen Mary University of London and is currently writing a book on London's relationship to the sea. His most recent publication is The Art of Cable Laying, in Emma Roberts' edited volume, Art and the Sea, which was published by Liverpool University Press in 2022. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Anne Elias, who will be speaking to us about deep sea divers below the city, the case of Sydney Harbour. Thank you everyone so much for coming this evening. I want to thank the Paul Mellon Centre, especially Rebecca Tropp for inviting me today and Ella Fleming for her um, excellent assistance. And I want to thank Morgan Daniels for his part as respondent. My research on oceans centres on the undersea and public interest in the undersea. For example, <clears throat> artists and filmmakers have been captivated by how the undersea reinvigorates aesthetics. In commerce, people have asked what the undersea as a resource might do for humanity. And in the sport of fishing and the study of natural history, people have wondered how undersea creatures perceive objects in their watery domain. For this seminar series, Out to Sea, where the focus lies on the influence of oceans on the visual and architectural imagination, I plan to discuss public interest in the deep sea divers who helped build and maintain the colonial and modern city of Sydney, located on the shores of Sydney Harbour and I intend to place an emphasis on aesthetics. In general, the job of the working diver was to build urban infrastructure, salvage wrecks and lost cargo, and remove underwater obstacles. The slide on the screen taken in the days before underwater photography was a common practice, captures in sequence the arresting sight of a diver coming to the surface from below. The public was fascinated by divers who went to work below the surface in a different world. Public newspapers shared that fascination. Consequently, historical newspapers are a reservoir of impressions and aesthetic experiences conveyed by divers to reporters and the public. The first newspaper printed in Australia was the Sydney Gazette, produced on a press brought to Australia in 1788. Then as the 19th century progressed, the number of newspapers increased. 
they made every effort to represent the variety of colonial and modern life. It was a newspaper report dated 1921 that first got me interested in the topic of deep sea divers below the city. Frank Hurley wrote for the Sun newspaper. He was a renowned explorer, filmmaker and photographer. In 1921, he believed the public should know more about the professional divers of Sydney Harbour. He wrote, within our midst, dwell a few men whose daily vocation takes them into the realms beneath the waves, of whom we hear nothing. The subject of deep sea divers below the city of Sydney therefore has three elements. The undersea, the media. Two themes emerge. First, the theme of colonial growth and environmental transformation in which new technologies were adapted to take charge of the undersea realm and enlarge colonial expansion. Second, the theme of conflicted relations of humans and the undersea, expressed in diver stories that exude an aesthetics of horrid fascination. While the undersea at, the, at Australia's tropical Great Barrier Reef of Australia to the north was a riot of colour. At the bottom of Sydney Harbour, in the temperate south, divers told the press about blackness and greyness and unsettling encounters in a gothic twilight zone. My talk covers 100 years of Sydney's history beginning in 1837, when the first diving suit was imported to the colonial town of Sydney and ends in the 1920s and 1930s when Sydney was a modern city. First, an orientation to place and time. On the east coast of the island continent of Australia in the state of New South Wales, bordering the Tasman Sea and the Pacific Ocean, lies Sydney Harbour, once named Port Jackson by James Cook. A drowned river valley, the harbour was created at the end of the last glacial period when the sea flooded the land, forming an estuary with deep coves. The waterway is as deep in symbolism as it is in material depth. Thousands of years before indigenous place names were changed and landscapes Europeanized, First Nations clans carved the shapes of fish, sharks, and whales into rocks above the harbour's shores, drawing attention to life below the water's surface. Today, descendants of the clans that engraved rocks with undersea animals, including Uncle Chicka Madden, an elder of the Gadigal clan, incorporate these oceanic imaginaries into the living culture of Aboriginal art. Following British invasion in 1788, the harbour became a working port and a recreational playground. It was customary for non-Indigenous Australians to name the waterway with the phrase, our beautiful harbour. The sandstone bays and blue water coves were praised as a masterpiece of nature and the harbour admired as one of the world's most distinctive visual environments. Surrounded with an atmosphere of romance, Sydney Harbour came to occupy a singular place in the waterway's European history. Sydney began as a colonial town and in 1842, the same date as this lithograph by the English artist John Skinner Prout, Sydney became a colonial city centred on the site of Sydney Cove, pictured here, a place known in the Aboriginal Sydney language as Warani. In the words of the Australian Town and Country Journal in 1875, Sydney Cove was symbolically the first effort to plant civilization and commerce in this quarter of the southern world, where previously savage life held undisputed 
sway, as it was put in the journal. This drawing <clears throat> intimates the monumental transformation of the natural and social world that took place when the colonist culture displaced the culture of the traditional owners. Before contact, Aboriginal people were Sydney Harbour's first divers, using breath hold techniques. And they were the first mariners, as detailed by curator Mariko Smith, a Yuan woman with Japanese heritage, and by historian Stephen Gaps. Reflecting on its history, historian Grace Carskins has described how Sydney is like many cities, the product of colonial expansion and indigenous dispossession, global migration, capitalism, and modernity. <clears throat> Ships and shipping were key to expansion. To look after ships better and to make sure that shipping and trade progress smoothly, it was vital to take charge of the underwater regions of the harbour and not just the surface. From the start of European presence, the underwater of the harbour figured directly in soundings and surveys and in the city's construction, expansion and maintenance. Anchors, for example, often became entangled. Undersea wrecks needed a clearing and salvaging and cargo frequently fell overboard. At first, to get better access to the underwater, colonists imported diving bells, devices that were lowered off ships and took one to two people below the surface to work. Diving bells worked on a similar principle to a glass placed in water upside down. As the water level rose, it trapped and compressed air and allowed those inside the bell to breathe as they went under. Then in 1837, the first newly invented diving suit arrived in Australia from its place of invention in London. This fact of history was discovered by the Australian diving historian Des Williams. After 1837, divers wearing individual standard driving, diving dress with screwed down helmets became regular members of the city's workforce. As diving theorists Damien Bright and Roy Kimmy explain, diving techniques were foundational to the project of industrial modernity. From the earliest days of European expansion in Sydney Harbour, undersea divers were essential workers. But this is an area of maritime history and ocean history that we hardly know. The first person of British ancestry to descend in a diving suit to the bottom of Sydney Harbour was a convict. And we can be sure he had little say in the matter. This much was discovered by Williams and is described in his 2023 book, Pioneer Divers of Australia. Daniel Gilchrist was charged with the crime of shop breaking and theft and punished by transportation in 1836 to the penal colony of Sydney in New South Wales. From 1788, Sydney was founded mostly by convicts, transported from Great Britain and Ireland. As explained by historian Frank Bongiorno, exile and forced labour for the development of public infrastructure were the punishments endured by convicts in Sydney. In the days when few people could swim, including sailors, Gilchrist was sent by his master to the bottom of Sydney Harbour to retrieve a valuable box of silver coins that had fallen overboard. He wore the first diving suit invented in England and the very first of its kind imported to Australia. According to Williams, the diving suit was an open diving dress and it was not watertight. Williams gives the background. In 1823, in Deptford, South East London, Charles Dean invented a helmet for firefighters to breathe while in smoke-filled spaces. His brother John, John Dean, ex-Royal Navy sailor, 
working for salvaging experts, thought the smoke helmet could be adapted for underwater work. Together they modified the helmet. They produced a copper helmet made to their specifications in London around 1827 by a coppersmith, Augustus Zeba. The helmet was attached to a canvas jacket fastened at the waist. In 1835, the Dean's patent diving apparatus was exhibited at the Submarine Exhibition in London. Dean published a diving manual titled Submarine Researches, and as Williams notes, the apparatus quickly found buyers across the world. The industries of salvage and underwater engineering meant a demand for the apparatus. Through the early colonial press and news from Britain, colonial Australians were aware of the, dive, of the diving invention by Dean. According to Williams, Australia was the third country to adopt the new Dean diving system. In early 1837, Captain Alexander Fotheringham, living in Sydney, had built a slipway facility in the expanding dockyard of Darling Harbour. For many years, Darling Harbour was the working port of Sydney. Fotheringham had may have visited the submarine exhibition in London because in 1835 he placed an order for the open diving apparatus to help his business. In July 1837, the Sydney Herald reported on the arrival of the diving suit which allowed the diver to remain underwater for about five hours. Marked with a red arrow on this and green arrow, on this 1909 map is Darling Harbour, part of the wider Sydney Harbour region. It was the supervisor of convicts in Sydney, Captain George Barney, who brought the convict Gilchrist to Darling Harbour to dive for the lost box of silver. This photograph provides some idea of the congested shipping that flourished at Darling Harbour, although it must be said the photograph was taken 33 years after Gilchrist's dive, and so this was a time that you're looking at here of more intense maritime development. In the spaces somewhere between ships, or next to a ship anchored in the stream, Gilchrist went underwater to find the silver. The newspaper said he dived in eight fathoms, or 48 feet. The silver was valuable because from 1825, boxes of imported British coin became the main form of exchange in the colony of New South Wales. And apart from symbolising the very embodiment of imperial power and the commercial expansion of the British Empire, boxes of silver also provided the conditions for formation of the capitalist in the colony of New South Wales. Three Sydney newspapers printed stories about Gilchrist's dive. In the cold and dark water, wearing helmet, India rubber dress and body weights, and with the tube to supply air for breathing, pumped by a tender from the surface, he searched on both sides of the ship in the thick harbour mud. He stayed down for over an hour during two separate attempts to find the box. As one newspaper reported, when he came up from below, he said he didn't feel exhausted but was shivering with cold. It was easy for people with a little knowledge of the undersea to forget that the under harbour was very much a material space of pressure, coldness and darkness. In the port areas of the harbour, the visibility was very poor. The thoughts that passed through Gilchrist's mind can only be imagined. Des Williams believes that Gilchrist accepted the dangerous job for a reduction in his sentence. Sadly, in the years before anything was properly understood about the dangers of water pressure and decompression sickness, Gilchrist would die in excruciating pain from an illness related to his ears. Gilchrist's story, which begins with the interconnections of colonialism, capitalism and convict slavery, sets the stage for an undersea history of professional dress diving in Sydney Harbour. In the later 19th century, the association of diving with coerced labour would come to define the pearling industry in Australia's north, which abused the labour of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander divers and divers from the Solomons, Fiji, Papua New Guinea 
and other Pacific nations in the colonial enslavement system known as blackbirding. By 1850, the era had begun of greater mobility and flexibility for a workforce that practiced their trades underwater, trades that included stone masonry, carpentry, and salvage. Within a few years, an improved closed standard diving dress was marketed in London by manufacturers Zeba and Gorman and by C.E. Heinke and Company. This familiar one-piece diving dress came with copper helmet, lead boots, and attached air hose and lifeline. But as you might be able to see from the writing at the bottom of the illustration from the Illustrated London News, people were ignorant of the dangers which attended the diver. And that is because in 1850, there was real ignorance about the undersea. The first standard dress divers began operation in Sydney Harbour in the mid 19th century a period of history, as maritime historian Helen Roswadowski has explained, for which it is difficult to express adequately human ignorance of the ocean's depths. Not until the 1920s, when the undersea began to feature in movies, in dioramas and photographs, and when underwater marine zoology increased, did the undersea regions of oceans get much attention, including the underwater of Sydney Harbour. So now, some idea of the wharf environments that divers worked in and the sensory nature of their encounters in Sydney Harbour. By the last decades of the 19th century, the port areas of Sydney were growing quickly. Exports and imports, travel and transport required bigger ships, a deeper harbour, plenty of room and no obstructions. Historian Peter Proudfoot writes that port improvements heralded an important era of urban construction. What is generally missing though in the writing of the history of port facilities and urban construction of Sydney Harbour is the demand for divers in the maritime workforce. When these two photographs of working divers in Sydney Harbour were taken in the 1890s, the harbour floor was shrouded in mystery. Diving historian Jeff Maynard explains that the ability of deep sea divers to work in the alien underwater was then considered remarkable. Surrounded by cranes are four professional harbour divers, seen most clearly in the image on the right. If I can, there's one. Here's another, there's one, and here's one. They are involved in work to modify the floor of the harbour in the heart of the city at Circular Quay, Sydney Cove. Many Sydney Harbour divers were employed by the Department of Public Works. They helped city planners and aided the transport industry. They detonated reefs with dynamite to deepen the harbour. They surveyed, measured, fixed pipes, laid cables. They helped the military, enforced maritime laws and port regulations, and detected criminal work. In the left photograph, a diver emerges from the water, and on the right, he stands on the ladder. Suited up and watching from above are the other divers waiting their turn to go under. Several people on boats and on the shore are attracted by the spectacle of the machine monsters diving nearby. Part of the dangers of a diver's everyday life were falling rocks, slipping cables, entanglements, and broken air tubes. In 1885, diver Richard Maynard was found lying on the harbour floor, the victim of defective air piping. Des Williams writes how the deep sea divers of Sydney Harbour slowly began to unionise in the 1890s. Newspapers affiliated with the Australian Labor Party, such as The Worker, reported on the deaths of divers, who were referred to as workmen under the water and as submarine labourers. At Circular Quay in the 1880s, huge rocks were extracted by divers, detonating dynamite in holes bored into the rock to allow the large P&O steamers to berth. 
In some instances, sandstone rocks were blasted from the bottom of the harbour and lifted out. In other situations, sandstone rocks were brought to the harbour and sunk underwater to help reclamation and build sea walls. And I'm not entirely sure what's happening here, but maybe someone in the audience has a good idea. Before 1901, wharves were either privately built and owned or publicly constructed and leased. From 1901, during a period of intensified international and interstate shipping, the Sydney Harbour Trust developed and modernised the port facilities, including deepening the bays. Here at Darling Harbour in 1900, 22 years earlier than this photograph, there was an outbreak of bubonic plague caused by infected rats living under the wharves. This prompted the reconstruction of Port Wharfage. Divers were important in wharf construction. When iron bark wharf piles were laid and drilling of underwater rock began, mud was a big problem. In places, the mud covering rock was nine feet deep. Divers were employed to clear the mud and prepare the rock for drilling. When this photograph was taken, Sydney Harbour was still a base for the commercial expansion of the British Empire across the Pacific. Images like these confirm what literary theorist Isabel Hofmeyer notes about port cities of the British Empire. They assert power at the critical conjuncture where land and sea meet, but they are uns unstable spaces, perched on reclaimed land and propped up by submarine engineering. Anxious and grim sums up the experiences of many harbour divers working near wharves in underwater landscapes that invoked ruin. Diver Lamb found himself absorbed one day in an examination of wharf piles in the inner harbour when suddenly a monster stingray, reportedly 12 feet long by 9 feet across, materialised in the semi-darkness and knocked him on his back in the mud, hovering above him, he said, like a huge umbrella. Mud, shapeless and formless, embodied the chaos below. It went against everything that the building of the city aspired to, namely the construction of solid, stable foundations. We could think here of the observations of surrealist writer Georges Bataille that in the division of the universe, mud and darkness symbolise the principles of evil. Apart from monstrous animals and mud, a third recurring theme in diver stories as reported in the press was the encounter with corpses, human and non-human. As ocean theorist Margaret Cohen has explained in writing about undersea Gothic, the dead spring to life, whether in the imagination of the observer or as, act, as actual ghost, when the story takes a supernatural turn. Sydney Harbour diver stories often took a supernatural turn. Divers maintained, for example, that the dead underwater were drawn to them like zombies. One diver working near a wall felt a bump and turned around to see the face of a dead man pressed against his helmet glass. From diverse stories in newspapers, the public came to think of the under harbour as an environment to dread and fear, and more so as a debased wilderness defined by black water, black mud, coal dust and sludge. In the background of this image is the smoky city of industrial city of Sydney Harbour, where working divers were often employed in the early 20th century. Here's the same diver about to go under. Divers went below in polluted water with little or no visibility. These were not scenic or beautiful sights on the harbour, they were called ugly. One area of the harbour where divers were often employed in the early 20th century was Black Wattle Bay in the area of Glebe. The area shown with the red arrow here and green. Located in this area, Blackwattle Bay, 
was the State Brickworks Wharf, timber yards, coal yards, and a boat service for transporting city waste for dumping in deeper water. Thick black mud and inky black water were commonly listed as the worst conditions that divers encountered and cited as the reason divers often failed in their work below. In 1915, at Black Wattle Bay, the blackness of the under harbour was at its worst. Diver Albert was sent below there to retrieve a load of 15,000 bricks that had sunk when a punt capsized. He had to grope in the dark and the evening news reported his story. We worked, we worked down there with our eyes shut for five days. Black, there is no name for it. Mud, dirty mud with a few dead dogs and cats to add to the flavour. The under harbour was macabre, dark and grim. The aesthetic of chromatic blackness was repeatedly mentioned in newspaper stories. Black Wattle Bay was named after an acacia tree, the black wattle, which in turn was named by colonists because of its dark bark. But there is an abundance of the word black in colonial language and in descriptions of the under harbour. Black wattle, black mud, black water. Aboriginal people were routinely called blacks, more specifically the blacks of Port Jackson. In terms of race politics in Australia and with reference to Sarah Ahmed's discussions of, ra of race, one thing that the insistence on blackness in the environment invokes is the privilege of whiteness. Especially in a country where settler colonials developed in 1901 a white Australia policy to privilege whites and exclude others, people of colour. The term black is well known to carry cultural prejudice and in colonial history, the terms black and dark are often racialised through cultural associations with the primitive and the savage, conditions that European civilization had aspired to leave behind. What about images of the bottom of Sydney Harbour? How was it represented in pictures in the years 1837 to 1930? In fact, I found very few photographs and illustrations for this period showing divers actually underwater. Instead, most of the pictures of divers show them preparing to go below, and the majority are from the early 20th century. This one was taken in a more scenic part of the harbour than you've been looking at. Images like this one are common in library collections. Whereas this one is unusual for its location in an art museum. The diver, though, is a model and the image metaphoric, I think, of humanity's quest for deeper truths. It's from a portfolio of male figures by Eric Keast Burke, who was elected an associate of the Royal Photographic Society of Great Britain in 1938. But illustrations do exist that show divers actually underwater. Although few in number, they can be found in newspapers and in diving manuals. In 1882, the Orient Steam Navigation Company steamship Austral the stylish new vessel on the England to Australia route arrived in Sydney Harbour in June and sank at its moorings after loading with coal. Many photographs of the stricken ship survive, taken from above the water's surface. <clears throat> to raise the ship, agents for the Orient Line in Sydney put 19 divers to work to seal the vessel before trying to float it. It was a feat of maritime engineering. The raising of the Austral was a major topic in Australian newspapers. As a pictorial vis vis visualisation of the sunken Austral, this illustration by artist James Walton Curtis is unique among pictorial records for imagining the floor of Sydney Harbour. Divers go about their work almost effortlessly the viewpoint is split focus, meaning we simultaneously see vertical depths and the horizontal plane across the surface of the water. 
The image, though, does not give much insight to the material reality of the bottom of Sydney Harbour, and none of it matches diver stories about the murkiness of harbour water, poor visibility, and the diver's reliance on touch rather than sight. Here at a depth reported to be 40 feet below the surface, we see an atmosphere almost as clear as daylight and as transparent as air. One reason for lack of environmental reality is the nature of the illustrator's main concern, which is to illuminate human achievement. The ship and divers are the primary subject, not the marvellous world of the undersea or the reality of the under harbour. This style of undersea image can also be found in illustrated diving manuals published in the 1870s. Like this 1971 diving manual published by the British submarine engineers, Heinke and Davis, who had an agency in Sydney, no doubt to serve the pearling industry. The manual, according to its pages, was written for men instructed in the art of diving for the purposes of blasting rocks, reefs, etc. As with the Curtis image of the Austral, the divers undertake effortless labour. The seafloor is shown as a terrestrial landscape, and a split focus, like an aquarium, reveals both the vertical and horizontal planes. James Curtis came from a seafaring family in England, but he himself did not work as a salvage diver, and so almost certainly had no eyewitness experience of the sunken Austral. But he did have an eye for compelling news subjects about the floor of Sydney Harbour, which he transformed into intriguing illustrations. Here is another example of work by Curtis intended to give viewers a startling perspective on the world below the surface of Sydney Harbour. In 1876, the Illustrated Sydney News reported on an encounter of a diver and a shark at Battery Point, Sydney Cove. The diver was working on the city's sewer pipes when the shark appeared. The Illustrated Sydney News was a monthly newspaper that published wood engravings um, in black and white, depicting li life in New South Wales. The paper was also sent by ship to readers in Britain who were eager for imagery relating to colonial life. As newspaper stories attest, and as Des Williams argues, at a time in modernity when the public knew very little about the undersea, the accounts of dress divers were fertile ground for fantasy. Curtis's image seems inspired by Jules Verne's novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, published with illustrations in 1871. A diver does battle with a shark on the harbour floor. With a sure-footed posture, he shows off his mastery of the undersea. The floor of Sydney Harbour has become a brand new stage for the figure of the colonial pioneer supporting Helen Roswadowski's claim that by the mid-19th century, the depths of the sea were considered ripe for imperial reach and influence. Although the shark looks somewhat playful, the animal is meant to invoke the savagery of the Australian wilderness, the alienness of the undersea, and highlight the heroism of the colonial subject in the process of overcoming the horrors and enemies of an uncivilised savage continent. John Miller, in an analysis of Victorian images of human-animal battles, interprets its conventions as symptomatic of the empire's desire for conquest, not only over animals and lands, but also over indigenous peoples. Is there any connection between this project on deep sea divers below the city and art? The project belongs to my broader interest in visual culture, but there are some interesting intersections with art. By that I mean the kinds of objects seen in art museums. Morgan Daniels, when writing about maritime labour and undersea cable laying, has proposed that maritime labour and modernism have an affinity that needs to be explored. And this claim, I think, has great value in a number of ways. We can compare, for example, this 1930s photograph 
of the diver about to go under with modernism in the 1930s. For the surrealists in the 1930s, for example, the deep sea diver was a metaphor for the modernist artist whose interest in the unconscious was also an interest in looking deeper below the surface. In the 1930s, the leader of the surrealists, André Breton, sought out photographs of the undersea for his novel, Mad Love. And in 1936, Salvador Dali performed on stage in London wearing a diving suit and helmet and nearly suffocated. The underwater for surrealism was a source of creativity in a psychic world. And herein lies the affinity and difference between maritime labor and modernism that Morgan refers to. Certainly in the discourse of the deep sea divers of Sydney Harbour, as reported in the press, are uh, intimations. They felt that below sea level lay something akin to the unconscious of the city, a place that hid secrets and harbored the repressed memories of society and objects discarded and drowned. However, working divers, unlike modern artists, very rarely celebrated the weird under harbour environment as liberating or creative. Instead, they described the floor of Sydney Harbour as an anxious place, not least because of limited sight, inhibited senses, and potential suffocation. Here are two of the best known Sydney divers of the time, Diver Carr on the left and Diver Lambert on the right. Did they like the undersea? Yes and no. Diver Charles Percy Lambert on the right wished in 1931 that the planet's oceans would dry up because water got in the way of work. Lambert was a celebrated salvage diver. He described what it felt like to descend underwater. He said, <clears throat> it was an eternal fight with tides and tearing seas, sweeping the diver from his objective and making the diver feel like an atom in an immensity of ocean. How much easier life would be, he was reported to say, if the oceans that cover two thirds of the globe were partially mopped up by a divine hand. He was not alone in describing his work as a fight with tides. In 1903, a report in Sydney from the London Daily Telegraph described the building of breakwaters and harbours by deep sea divers in England as their fight with the sea. Lambert was not alone either in dreaming about oceans drained of water. It was an era that conceived the history of the planet as the conflict of water and land. In fact, the fight with the sea and the conflict of water and land are reasons why so much of Sydney's foreshores were reclaimed. Finally, the volume of literature on historic Sydney Harbour is daunting. But as historian of early Sydney, Grace Carskin said in 2002, there are always more histories and stories to write. Despite the central role of oceans for First Nations people, for whalers, explorers, convicts and colonists, the material undersea itself has been less prominent in the scholarship of Sydney Harbour than the land. But under the surface of Sydney Harbour are alternative histories, including the history of deep sea divers below the city. Very often, they portrayed the area below the surface of the harbour as threatening and dangerous. In this, though, they echoed the broader anxieties that have been projected throughout history onto the undersea. An environment, as Margaret Cohen and Killian Quigley point out, that we treat as alien, but we reach simply by stepping off the edge of the shore. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca and Ella, for making all this happen. And thank you, Anne, for uh, an extraordinarily wide-ranging and um, provocative paper. And it's that wide-ranging nature of, of the paper that I want to focus on first. Um, I mean, in this 
study of the humble diver. Um, you've taken us into uh, the exploitation of workers, uh, into settler colonialism, into racism, uh, into uh, the domination of nature and all the degradation of the planet that implies. Um, and of course, all of these things are, are essential uh, connect, and connected elements of uh, of the capitalist system. Um, so I, I, the, sort of the first point I want to make really is that I, I think this is something that oceanic thinking does. I mean, right now there is a sort of trend uh, within academia towards what's being called the blue humanities, which takes uh, the sea as a um, interdisciplinary uh, object of study, the sea and other bodies of water. Uh, and if this project is to have um, uh, a real purpose, uh, I think it is in the, in the sort of engendering of systemic thinking. All the things that you're describing are necessary systemic elements of capitalism. Uh, and you know, thinking through the sea makes us think about the connections between all these apparently disparate things. Um, the same system that exploits labor, exploits the planet, um, requires racism, expands um, over the lands of others and, and, and so on. Um, so far as the tendencies of capitalist society go, um, obviously one of the things that, that capitalism does is that it pushes its undesirable elements to the periphery. Um, again and again, we, we find uh, the sort of perceived waste products of, of the society shoved you know, out of the metropole, out of the, the mainstream. Um, as in, you know, out-of-town landfill sites or, uh, you know, Amazon warehouses or the, the, pol the Rwanda policy of our government. And um, with, with regards to, yeah, this tendency to shove the undesirable um, away from the centre, um, I'm, I'm somewhat obsessed with this figure of Gilchrist, who is not only transported to the prison island of Australia, but is then dropped in the harbour. You know, I mean, that's that's quite a that's quite a removable uh, quite a removal from um, uh, you know polite society. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm sort of quite haunted by yeah by the the fact that it is it is convict labour which is forced first of all under the under the sea, and I think that is it speaks to the the general tendencies of of capitalism. Um, all this sort of talk about. The, the hidden elements of society and the repressed elements of society um, absolutely uh, takes us into the question of, of surrealism. Um, I mean, by the way, it is the, the centenary of the Surrealist Project this year. Happy 100 years to surrealism. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was the revolutionary conjecture of, of surrealism that... Um, that capitalist society, a market organized society, um, I mean, represses all sorts of things, represses, um, you know, all sorts of psychic worlds, the world of dreams and, and so on. Um, this very much is, is kind of what Marx was getting at with his notion of alienation too. Um, and the sort of surrealist proposal, you know, was to create a form of art that did justice to, uh, to hidden psychic worlds, uh, sought to reconcile seen and unseen worlds. Um, and I think there's sort of two things to say here. I mean, the first is that obviously the Surrealists made it their aim to create art which purposefully did justice um, to, to the unseen and which put the seen and unseen into dialogue. Um, but I guess it's also the point that the sort of the, the nature and um, contradictions of mass culture means that again and again the, the media, the mass media, very much the mainstream media goes surreal too. Um, is it okay if I go back a couple of slides? I, yeah, if I can figure out how to do that. You know. um, uh, I mean, for, for me, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, the nature of the nature of the sort of mainstream media means that a lot of the techniques. That were that were fostered by the surrealists um, end up being kind of commonplace within, but both deliberately and otherwise within the mass media. So, you know, you have, as John Berger once once uh, illustrated, you have magazines that have 
things juxtaposed which really ought not to be juxtaposed. You know, images of, uh, of war-torn countries next to adverts for Coca-Cola or whatever it might be. You know, this is all grist to the mill for the surrealists. Um, and yeah, in the illustrated press, you have, you have this kind of thing going on as well. I mean, for me, this is a surreal image. Uh, and I don't just mean, you know, it's a bit weird and there are these guys in sort of sci-fi sci -fi suits wandering around the seabed. But as you say, there's this kind of dual focus. There's this uh, split focus. Um, we see both the seen and unseen worlds. And there's a kind of double repression that is being revealed here. It's not just that we're seeing the seabed, but we're also seeing workers. We're seeing labor. And as a general rule, you know, we're not really meant to think about labor all that often. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of sublime surrealist image, so far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, 40 years, almost exactly 40 years, um, 40, well, 40, yeah, 42 years before um, surrealism formally announced itself onto the, onto the stage. Um, I want to um, say two more things if I've got time. Is that okay? Um, 10 minutes isn't very long. Um, uh, the first is, um, well, it's the 1st of May. Happy May Day, everyone. Happy International Workers' Day, everyone. Uh, it seems a, a beautiful, um, a poetic thing that um, this paper that has redeemed uh, a hidden, dangerous labor um, takes place on, on International Workers' Day. Uh, and there's, of course, an additional element of poetry um, uh, 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 to this because May Day, as we understand it, um, it really has its origins in Australia. Um, it was in the 1850s, um, 1856, that uh, Masons working on Melbourne University downed tools and actually very quickly successfully um, uh, agitated for the eight hour uh, working day without the loss of pay. Um, and this was ritualized and celebrated in a march every, every year, um, greatly inspiring the, um, greatly inspiring American, American labor and the, the American labor movement. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, from almost the moment that convict labor was, in, was, was shipped over and employed in Australia, there, there were strikes. You know, we're talking about, you know, the, the, the withdrawal of labor, the agitation by labor in the most awful and, and difficult circumstances. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a big strike back in 1791, um, uh, I think, in, in, uh, in New South Wales, um, uh, and, and so on. So the first thing I'm going to be asking, just to prepare you for this, is, is about um, the way in which diving um, and the attempts to unionize diving, which you said took place in the 1890s, um, how that kind of um, intersected with the, the labor movement, um, which obviously had quite radical elements in Australia. Um, uh, you know, I mean, one of the other things to sort of say is that oftentimes people who are transported to Australia came, came with radical politics attached. You had the Chartists sent over, and actually one of the leaders of the 1856 strike was a, was a Chartist, a trades unionist back in, back in Britain. So I'm, I'm going to be interested, I'm going to sort of ask a bit about, about the unionization of all this and how successful that was and how radical it was. Um, no spoilers. Um, the final, final point, if, if, I, if I have time for it, um, is this. Um, you know, this study, as I say, of, the, of the, this figure of the diver, this, um, this, dive into, this dive into diving, so to speak, um, has, for me, you know, led to this huge splurge of thoughts, um, uh, this wide-ranging splurge of thoughts. And... Um, yeah, I want to just sort of uh, end by uh, talking about yeah, talking about the the, the sea and, and and what it is that you've done here, because uh, as I said at the beginning, um, thinking through the sea necessarily you know leads to systemic and interconnected thinking. It's it's what we need if we are to be serious about some of the big political questions of the day. It's you know we, we need if we're going to be serious about. Um, ecological meltdown, if we're going to be serious about um, the grand reckoning for, for Western colonialism, all of this necessitates thinking through and with the sea. Um, so uh, this is all true, I think, 
But of course, it's happening, you know, all, all this stuff is happening, all these big political questions are happening at precisely the same time that most of us have less direct um, connection with the sea than ever. Um, certainly in Sydney, um, there has been a whole, whole new displacement um, of people, um, meaning uh, the displacement of the, the, the working class um, in, in, you know, in, in what was once a, 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 working, a working port, you know, is now the site and space of luxury condos and, and, and so on. Um, and this, you know, this process of us losing sense of the, uh, a sense of the sea, this uh, process of, of widespread working class displacement from inner city maritime areas and yeah, it's, it's displacement with you know, things like Canary Wharf and so on. Um, you know, this is what Alan, Alan Sekula, the, 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 great, the late great um, Marxist photographer, um, called the disappearance of the sea and he was writing in the 1990s. So yeah, I wanna thank you really because it seems to me that um, we need to go back to the sea and um, and your your um, jump below the surface of the sea, um, going below the going below the surface is always a radical thing, because we're not meant to go below the surface. Um, your jump below the surface has, uh, as far as I'm concerned, has been a very very important uh, addition to this conversation around the maritime and the redeeming of the maritime that we're all going to have to have to have. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, as I say, so I, I think such a such a, a vital and um, energetic um, insight uh, into yeah a hidden history. And so yeah, I, I just want to ask particularly about the you know from a, from a, the perspective of labour history first. I, I, I'll, I'll restrict myself to two questions and then we'll open up to the floor. Um, yeah, I mean, do you know how successful uh, unionising was amongst divers? And do you know if there were sort of many sort of intersections with the more radical elements of uh, of the Australian of Australian labour. Well, it's it's something I know only a little bit about, um, in the sense that this is an area for a research project. Mm. Um, bearing in mind that the divers of Sydney Harbour are barely researched, um, with the exception of. Uh, a couple of historians in the Historic Diving Society of Australasia, Des Williams, I mentioned today, and Jeff Maynard. Um, I don't know of much research on the divers, and yet they were um, vital members of the workforce, and as you put it, um, hidden dangerous work. But what's interesting is that some divers were employed by... Um, independent employers. Some divers were employed by public works, so the government, and that uh, they were fragmented as a group, from what I can gather, and that was the reason for the slowness of their unionisation, um, which I think gathered speed around 1950, 1960, with various maritime um, unions forming and then reforming and changing their names, it's a complicated history. So I'd say it started in a fragmented way and gathered momentum towards the end of the 20th century and has much, uh, as far as I know. But what's interesting, and I won't go on about this because this is way too complicated, but what's interesting is the relationship of the unions to the divers who worked in the pearling fields because with the introduction in Australia of the white Australia policy, protecting the worker who was white, the only industry that was allowed to employ people of colour, Japanese and Indonesian divers, was the pearl diving industry. So, it, so the diving history of Australia is incredibly complex in relation to the labour movement. That's all I can say about it at this stage. Thank you. I mean, it's... I, I don't want to know everything about diving, you know? I, I just want to know everything about diving. Um, but it's, it seems that this is a, a you know, a, a major area of, 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 further, of further study and further research. Um, 
If I can just, yeah, indulge me with indulge me with one more question. Um, I, I sort of discussed towards the end this this experience that has been a global experience of um, yeah of the, the 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 loss of sort of urban maritime infrastructure through containerization, and it's been experienced you know in all the great in all the great maritime cities, very much including London. Um, your, I mean, you you uh, you know Sydney very very well. Um, do you think there are um, particular uh, particulars to um, the sort of disappearance of, of of maritime industry and with it the that kind of um, that working class um, that long that long seated working class in Sydney? Um, do you think there are particulars to the the loss of the sea in in Australian port towns as compared to um, New York or Shanghai or London? Um, you know, in terms of Australia's history, in terms of the sort of the sort of industry that that that, that takes place in um, in Sydney, um, yeah. How has how has containerisation and neoliberal neoliberalism um, affected Australia particularly? Uh, well, look, I can only talk about Sydney a little bit here, and that is to say, well, of course, with the disappearance of the port facilities in Sydney Harbour, um, many things have changed. But one way in which they have changed in a positive way, if you like, is that there has been a redevelopment that some of you might know called Barangaroo, which was the historic port area of Sydney. And the reason for its um, development um, so it was the port area of Sydney, uh, and the reason for its development, the, the planners, the architects, the visionaries, and they were visionary, who um, conceived of this development in the old port area, was to redesign it so that the public would have a sense of what Indigenous people used to have and what they'd lost. And so in that sense, there has been quite an impressive uh, rethinking of the old port area, which isn't aligned to what you're talking about in terms of the working class. But these areas of, but it is slightly because these areas of Barangaroo, like Maranawi Cove, is a place now where anyone in the public can go and get in the water of the old working port in the industrial water. It's quite an amazing thing to do. I've done it three times. Because you want to feel what it feels like to have that historic memory of the water surround you in that very um, politically poignant part of Sydney. And so in that sense, I think there has been something really strong gained there in the development of what used to be the port area. Thank you. I mean, I have so many follow-up questions to that, but it's not fair for me to, to hog things. So um, we have... Well, uh, so how much time do we have? 10, 10, 15 minutes? 10, 15 minutes. So that's time for at least three, four questions. Um, who, who has a, a question for Anne on any of the many, many interconnected things um, that we've been hearing about? Hi, hello. Thank you so much for uh, this really beautiful talk. Um, so I'm going to try and make sense of what I wanted to ask, and maybe it's more of a comment, but I was thinking about those divers and their uh, vision of, or their, um, of the underwater environment as very gloomy. And I was wondering if you were able also to trace uh, the transformation of the underwater environment, the tur turbidity change, as well through the industrial process itself. Um, is there any account of an estuary that was perhaps clearer and how this gloominess also came with um, it becoming a working port. And then my other uh, point of question was about uh, also that you pointed that there was little um, imaginary of the underwater, yet you started this talk with those beautiful um, drawing of uh, a shark uh, from an Aboriginal. Um, and I was wondering also, if you research that, a sort of way of also challenge the Western relationship to this underwater realm. Okay, on the first point, 
which is about environmental history, um, within a very short time of the British establishing the colony, the harbour was significantly polluted. Um, so I would say from about 1850 all the way to 1970, the harbour was seriously um, degraded uh, in all sorts of ways. It was a rubbish tip. Everything went into the harbour. And <clears throat> it wasn't till the 1970s that a policy of cleaning the water happened. And that is why now in 20... 24, um, you can get into the water in the old port area because the city of Sydney says it's clean enough. So a lot of work has been done. It smells a bit, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I trust them. <laughs> uh, but, oh, through the 19th century and, of course, with the bubonic plague and so on. Um, no, it was a seriously putrid place. Um, a second point about indigenous relationships to the undersea or the harbour and the underwater. Um, um, I can't quite remember what you were saying or what your question was, but all I can say is that as I do my research and I talk to people who are indigenous and connected with Sydney Harbour, the more complicated the relationship to ocean and land becomes, and I'm not trying to interpret what is being said, but, um, and, and for example, even talking about those carvings as I was conscious that I was possibly saying the wrong thing in talking about those carvings as being representative of the animals underwater because that is my, my, um, that, that's my interpretation of that. Um, there's a whole area of community knowledge that stays in communities and I... I'm not trying to include that in my, my study. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a question here and then at the, at the front. Um, yeah, to follow, to follow on, um, thank you so much. What a really interesting presentation. I think we're used to... We're, we're often used to hearing about the colonisation of the land and what that means, and here we're looking at it from a different perspective, that it was also water and then the under harbour. Um, I'm trying to formulate the question because I'm thinking even... I'm thinking of the harbour tunnel that goes under the, under the harbour and the, the symbolism of, of that in relation to, I don't know, art historical <laughs> contexts or um, his imperial city's context. I'm not sure... I'm not, I can't quite formulate the question, but it seems to me... A, I, I love this concept of the under harbour but then we have the tunnel that is under the under harbour as well, and and that you know that's particularly because of that sandstone and that that we are able to do that. I, I think that um, disorienting, estranging idea of layers of water, rock, water, rock comes up a lot in relation to um, the under harbour not just in relation to the tunnels, but also, well, yes, tunnels of all kinds. Not just transport tunnels, but the coal tunnels that were tunnelled under the water in the sandstone that lies beneath the water of Sydney Harbour. So that the people who... So that there is a coal seam that runs under Sydney Harbour, and in 1893 work began on that. And it was about the colonial, or the imperial idea of the extraction of wealth. That's what the tunnel with the coal mine was all about. Um, the people who worked in the mine, tunnelling the coal literally by hand, 
had the water above them and imagined the sharks swimming over their head. And I always just find that, that's why this is a project about aesthetics. To me, and it's related to art, it's that constant estrangement from familiarity that comes up with this idea of the under, the under harbour. Thank you. Fascinating. And, and then at the front? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, this is an online question. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance if I'm mispronouncing your name, but Toby Julith um, said, thank you, Anne. I'm interested in the emergence, or should that be submergence, of diving as a profession and how contemporary underwater explorations in Hobart and elsewhere contributed to the movement of divers and equipment around early colonial Australia. What do we know of the proliferation of diving explorations throughout this period? Um, I'll just have to defer here to Wes... Uh, Des uh, Williams's book on divers. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your first name. Um, thank you for your question. Um, nationwide, I haven't got anything there for you on that, but certainly Sydney was the main centre and the absolute first centre because it was where the first deep sea diving suit was imported. Um, but then very quickly, I mean, from newspaper reports, I know that Melbourne developed its own diving labour culture. Um, Hobart did too. And so I guess concurrently all the main cities very quickly developed a technological expertise and a labour force that those cities may, the public in those cities may not have known much about as they or, or, or whatever, but um, that meant the development of those ports. That's the only way I can answer that question, I'm afraid. So there was a question at the back. Thank you. Um, a couple of thoughts. First of all, thinking about the, the subterranean as opposed to the submarine and thinking in visual culture terms um, you, you probably know some of this material but in Victorian Britain and in Paris in the mid 19th century I'm thinking of uh, quite a remarkable body of, of wood engravings and other prints that appear in the newspapers of the tunnelling that's involved with the, the first um, subways, the first uh, the metro and the, and the tube. Um, and from a visual point of view in terms of modernism and in terms of new angles and, I mean, visually there's lots of similarities. I mean, we're not talking about water, but in terms of two worlds and in terms of submerged workers, there's, there's something really interesting there. But my other thought, I mean, I, I had lots of thoughts because it's such rich material, but thinking about the beach as a... And as we know that the beach is a, a, a space which has been much theorised in, in Australia. Um, but thinking of that as a, in comparison with, with the, the depth and the verticality of, the, of what you're looking at and the darkness of what you're looking at, the beach, of course, is a, is a, a space of white leisure, in, particularly in the early period of Federation after 1900, as you know, and I'm thinking of, is it Charles Meir, the famous beach painting, which, which then becomes very much tied up with, with Australian nationalism. So, um, you know, I'm having lots of thoughts. I, I don't know whether there's probably not time here for you to answer any of that, but uh, there we go. That's Actually, let, let's try the first one, because uh, I'm really interested in the, um, the visual comparison between the subterranean and the submarine, or the subaquatic, or all those terms. Um, particularly through the links geologically with the Blue Mountains and the caves of the area just west of Sydney and the harbour and how um, some people drew that connection uh, and how um, Charles Darwin travelled when he got to Sydney Harbour to the Blue Mountains 
looked down the Wentworth Falls, and it's, this is a very famous passage from his writing, he imagined a, a dry harbour floor. And from that, a number of people, geologists, started to talk about the comparison between uh, the Blue Mountains valleys and the harbour of Sydney. So that's a really rich area that I try to go into that I'm struggling with because geology is not, you know, all, as you say, this is a project that covers a lot of dis different disciplines and sometimes I think I'm well out of my depth, but geology is really important to know there. The other thing about the beach and the harbour is interesting too because um, nationalism does blossom on, on, on the surf beaches of Sydney. Um, and you have modernist artists like Max Dupain, very famously did a photograph called The Sun Baker of the you know, monumental man lying on the sand and it's one of the iconic photographs of Australian art. He, and I've asked people who are very familiar with his work, did he ever use an underwater camera? Because the visual artists, the modernists in Australia, never seemed to want to look under the harbour, which I find intriguing because to me, the first thing I think about is, what's it like under there? What does it look like? They didn't even try to imagine under the harbour. So that is another area that really interests me. And um, it's really weird to write about art that's, not, that's about the under harbour, but with no images of the under harbour. That is a weird area of what I'm doing at the moment. I've been told that that was probably the last question, yeah, because, you know, the, it was a... No, 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 I, I, after you finish, I'll take the mic. Yeah, because, you know, there's, there's wine to drink. Um, uh, just, like, if I can say 10 seconds worth of thing on the first point about the sort of uh, analogy between the subterranean and the submarine. Um, there's just been published um, a, a, new, a, a very slim but very sort of politically um, important book um, uh, a collection of some of the writings from John, John Berger, him again, his archive, and it's his writings on, on mining, because um, obviously we're in the 40th anniversary of the catastrophic miner strike. Um, he, wrote a, a pro, he made a program for the BBC about mining, um, and the, uh, which is in, the script is included in the, in the, in the, in the book. Um, the title for this collection of, of writing around mining um, comes from his original proposed title for that, BBC series, which is the Underground Sea, um, and Berger has a lot of um, has a lot to say about those you know those parallels through through his his work. So that that might be something to, to think about as well. Anyway, okay. Um, I, I I'd like to apologize to anyone online whose question we were not able to get to, um, but we do need to wrap up um, and move on to the next stage of the evening for those of you who are here in the room, um, which is to have a more informal discussion, meeting of people, talking to our speaker and our respondent um, about this really rich material. Um, I certainly have my own questions, but I didn't want to hog the, the floor. Um, but before we do, um, I would just like to thank Anne and Morgan one more time.